Hello and welcome to The Daily Space. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay and most weekdays the CosmoQuest team is here putting science in your brain. Today, however, is for Rocket Roundup. This week we're doing things a bit differently. We're highlighting select launches instead of covering all nine orbital and suborbital launches that happened in the last two weeks. There were simply too many rockets that launched over our break and there's not enough time in the show to cover all of them completely and still include all our usual segments. So let's look at the top launches, shall we? First up, on August 22nd at 22.13 UTC, Ariane Space and its affiliate StarSim launched a Soyuz 2.1B frigate from the Balkanor Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. On board the Soyuz were 34 satellites for the OneWeb 9 mission. It was the 1944th Soyuz launch since its first in 1957. Let's watch that launch. This launch was delayed by one day due to an abort moments before engine ignition on the first attempt, which is highly unusual for a Soyuz rocket. The abort was due to the rocket's ground system seeing something it didn't like in the final count and calling a hold, something that can happen to any rocket. The rocket's frigate upper stage conducted several engine burns over the course of two and a half hours and then inserted the 34 satellites into their target orbits in several groups. This marks 288 satellites launched of a planned constellation of 648 OneWeb Internet satellites, making the constellation about 44% complete. Next up, on August 24th at 11.15 UTC, a Chinese Long March 2C Yuan Zhong 1S third stage delivered three integrated experimental satellites into polar orbit. According to state satellite manufacturer, China Aerospace Science and Technology Group, they have a communication technology test mission. This flight of the Long March 2C debuted two new features. This was the first time a new wider 4.2 meter diameter fairing was used. The usual fairing is 3.35 meters in diameter, matching the diameter of the rocket. These satellites apparently would not fit into the standard sized fairing and needed a wider fairing for launch. The rocket also used a new type of launch adapter to securely hold all three of the satellites on the upper stage. Although it's not another first for this flight, it was only the second flight for the Long March 2C YZ-1S third stage. A total of 20 of these upper stages have flown, mostly to deploy Bedou satellites in medium Earth orbit, and several other versions exist for other Chinese rockets. You know how we mentioned that there were too many rockets launched and not enough time to cover them all? There were two other Chinese launches that took place during the break. Both were military in nature and there wasn't much information about them other than the usual statements issued by the Chinese government for classified missions. Patreon members can read about what we do know uh, about these other missions in our show notes. On August 26th at 1431 UTC, a Blue Origin New Shepard suborbital rocket launched the NS-17 mission from the company's Van Horn, Texas launch site. On board were 18 scientific payloads and no human passengers. 11 of the payloads were NASA supported. Let's watch the launch. Four, commanded to start. Two, one, zero. <laughs> Shepard has cleared the tower on her way to space from the 
West Texas desert carrying Lunar Lander technology, as well as New Shepard's first ever art installation. On the outside of the booster was NASA's deorbit descent and landing sensor demonstration, which improved on a sensor package previously flown on the NS-13 flight back in 2020. The technology will allow landing at sites on the moon not possible during the Apollo mission. NS-17 also carried artwork on the outside of the uncrewed capsule. Three paintings which were installed on the main shoot covers made by Ghanaian painter Amoko Bafo. They depict himself, his mother, and his mother's friend. Both the booster and capsule landing were successful. Let's watch these. Seeing quite rapidly on the left side of your screen, those in West Texas are now hearing that sonic boom. New Shepard is on approach. That BE-3 engine relay confirmed. Landing gear deployed. That beautiful hover. And booster touchdown. There go the drogues. That capsule speed will slow and the main parachutes will follow shortly here. And there go the mains, further slowing the crew capsule here on its way back to the West Texas desert. They'll start to completely inflate here and that West Texas landscape will come into the view in your background. Our retro thrust system in the base of the crew capsule will kick up a tremendous amount of dust as it fires for that nice soft landing. Rest assured the payloads will enjoy quite a soft touchdown in just a few seconds here. And touchdown of the crew capsule, another beautiful launch and landing for after a break, we'll be back with more science to the space station and two little rockets that tried. And now for some launches from the United States, including from Alaska. We have a little rocket that couldn't quite do it. On August 28th at 2235 UTC, an Astra Space Rocket 3.3, yes, that's really the name, launched uh, from the equally blandly named STP 27AD1 mission from the Pacific Spaceport Complex Launch Pad 3B in Kodiak, Alaska. Let's just go straight to the video. The rocket lifted off, but almost immediately took a 10 degree pitch and hovered sideways for some distance, burning a dark streak in the grass around the launch site as it traveled horizontally away from the launch pad. Finally, at T plus 16 seconds, it burned enough propellant to begin rising away from the Earth, you know, the direction rockets are supposed to go, and it headed downrange. Just over two minutes later at max Q, the point of maximum dynamic pressure on the spacecraft during launch, the rocket immediately tumbled over end over end and was observed shedding debris. At this point, it was heading out of the safety corridor where it could have potentially hit someone or something. So range safety commanded the shutdown of the rocket's engines. And yes, in case you were wondering, Astra's launch webcast did indeed cover every event, including the flight's rather explosive termination. After the launch, Astra CEO Chris Kemp said that the rocket's odd liftoff was because one of its five main engines failed less than one second after ignition. The poor rocket was doomed from the start. Even though the rocket didn't make it to space, it still had a payload. 
the United States Space Force flew an instrumented test payload instead of a real satellite. This test payload recorded the flight environment of the rocket. Although that may not sound exciting, the data collected by the test payload would have been used by Astra and their customers to get a better idea of how the rocket flies, so the customer can ensure their payload will be able to withstand vibration and acceleration on its way to space. On August 29th, at 0314 UTC, a SpaceX Falcon 9 launched the CRS-23 mission towards the International Space Station from LC-39A at the Kennedy Space Center. Cargo Dragon C-208 was deployed about 12 minutes after liftoff, beginning its second trip to the International Space Station. It is the first Cargo Dragon 2 to be reused, with its first flight on CRS-21 back in December 2020. Onboard Dragon was the usual complement of scientific experiments and technology demonstrations. In total, it brought 2,207 kilograms of cargo up to the station. That's the equivalent of just over 1,100 2-liter soda bottles of stuff. This was the fourth flight for booster 1061. It successfully landed on the a short fall of Gravitas ship, SpaceX's newest drone ship, marking the 90th landing of a Falcon booster. Let's watch the launch and the landing. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, zero. Ignition and lift off. Cargo Dragon takes flight, continuing a busy year of deliveries to a crew of seven aboard the International Space Station. Stage one chamber pressure is nominal. Burn startup. And there is the beginning of the Entry burn, three Merlin engines have relit and are currently slowing down the stage first stage. Stage one, entry burn, shut down. Stage one, landing leg, deploy. Stage one, landing confirm. One of the technology demonstrations will help astronauts take better care of their eyes. The retinal diagnostics device takes an off-the-shelf ophthalmology lens and puts it in a handheld device suitable for use on orbit. It will be used to take pictures of astronauts' retinas to monitor the progression of space-associated neuroocular syndrome. This condition affects astronauts who perform long-duration missions in space and comes from increased fluid in the head due to microgravity. This results in swelling of the optic nerve and flattening of the eye shape. The change in an astronaut's vision is severe enough that they need glasses to see clearly when they return to Earth. With future missions to Mars planned, astronauts need to be able to diagnose themselves instead of needing a trained professional in an office full of equipment. The mobile diagnostic device will also help treat patients in remote or extreme environments on Earth. In addition to its payloads for the inside and outside of the station, CRS-23 also carries CubeSats to be deployed into orbit. The group of CubeSats, called Educational Launch of NanoSats, Elena, it includes 37 CapSats, a three-unit CubeSat designed to test different technologies, including thermal management, deployable panels, and a single photon avalanche detector, which is an electrical sensor for detecting very faint signals down to a single photon, as the name suggests. The breadloaf-sized CAPSAT will specifically investigate the on-orbit repair of said sensor by annealing or heating it up and cooling it down in a controlled manner using a laser to allow the atoms of the sensor to reorder themselves into an undamaged state. You can read about these and two other CubeSats carried by CRS-23 in our Patreon show notes. 
Finally, on September 2nd at 1 UTC, a Firefly Alpha rocket took its debut flight launching from Slick 2 w at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. This rocket's first ever launch was named Dedicated Research and Education Acceler Accelerator Mission, which can be shortened to DREAM. Let's watch. The Alpha rocket ignited its four Reaver engines and headed southwest. Unknown to most viewers, the rocket had lost an engine 15 seconds after liftoff, which made it accelerate slowly, taking over two minutes to go supersonic. Seconds after finally passing through the sound barrier, the rocket cartwheeled end over end twice before being detonated by range safety. The dramatic end of the flight was caused by something more mundane. The valves simply closed due to loss of electrical signal, according to Firefly CEO Tom Muzarek. A combination of the slower ascent and early failure meant that the rocket's trajectory was largely vertical. Most of the lightweight debris from the rocket fell back onto land in Orcutt, California, about 16 kilometers southeast of the launch pad, where people posted pictures onto social media. The rocket's first stage engines landed much closer to the launch pad, only 1.2 kilometers away. The 30th Space Wing, who runs the range in California, stated that the rocket was blown up while it was over the water. So about those payloads. Firefly ran a competition through 2020 to select payloads which would launch for free on the first flight of the Firefly Alpha. 12 payloads were selected, including small satellites of all shapes and sizes, along with art pieces. This was an incredible opportunity. Build the satellite, go to space for free. But there's a catch. It's risky to have your expensive payload going up on the first launch of a new rocket. Of the rockets introduced in this century, half have failed on their first launch. Why would somebody do this? Well, launch costs are a significant barrier for CubeSat operators to get their payloads in orbit, costing many times more than the satellite itself. NASA and the military launch multi-billion dollar spacecraft, where a few hundred billion dollars for launch is just a rounding error in the budget. you take a free launch too if you could. After the break, the first flight of Luna 16 is on our docket, as well as the first robotic sample return from the moon. Stay tuned. This week in rocket history, the first successful robotic sampler return from the moon, Luna 16. But first, some background. The Soviet Union made several attempts starting in 1969 to return samples from the moon with robotic spacecraft as part of their wider Luna program, which included flybys, impactors, and lunar rovers. Most of the first five attempts at sample return failed and were either not acknowledged by the Soviets or given really generic code names like Cosmos 300 to hide their true purpose. However, one of them, Luna 15, almost made it. Luna 15 was the second attempt by the Soviets to do a sample return, and it was launched on July 13, 1969, and successfully burned for the moon. It was in lunar orbit at the same time as the crewed Apollo 11 mission, and even attempted to land the day after Neil and Buzz. Unfortunately, it crashed on the surface of the moon some 553 kilometers northwest of where Apollo 11 landed. That's a little more than the distance between Houston and New Orleans in the U.S. 
the next attempt. Luna 16 was the sixth attempt by the Soviets to conduct a fully autonomous sample return mission from the moon. Luna 16 was launched on a Proton-K Block D rocket from Balkanor on September 12, 1970. The spacecraft weighed a massive 5,750 kilograms at launch. Most of that mass was propellant for its lunar descent stage. Five days after launch, Luna 16 entered lunar orbit to study lunar gravity and the terrain around the landing site. This extra step was necessary to prevent another failure. Luna 15 had crashed into the side of a mountain that the Soviets didn't even know about. Lunar descent was initiated on September 20th. The entire landing sequence took six minutes and was conducted using two different sets of engines, a main engine for the majority of the landing sequence and a different set of easier to control, lower thrust landing engines for the final 20 meters. It landed successfully at 518 UTC in the Sea of Fertility. This was the first landing on the moon in the dark. Only one hour after landing, the spacecraft set to work drilling and collecting its sample. The drill managed to go 35 centimeters into the lunar surface before hitting a rock. The collected regolith was transferred into the return capsule and the upper stage of the lander blasted off the moon's surface at 743 UTC on September 21st after spending nearly 27 hours on the surface. The return trajectory was very simple, a direct burn back to the Earth's atmosphere. The return capsule landed back in Kazakhstan at 326 UTC on September 24th. During reentry, it was subjected to a maximum of 350 Gs of force. That's 175 times more than a shuttle astronaut experienced. With the successful return of the samples to Earth, planetary scientists were able to get to work. Scientific analysis of the Luna 16 regolith samples demonstrated that these soils were different from many of the other samples thus far collected on the Moon, and suggested a far more complicated geologic history for our only natural satellite. Although the rocks collected were basaltic, which is a common volcanic rock type on both Earth and the Moon, these rocks contained iron-rich pyroxene. The higher iron content showed that these rocks originated from a different volcanic process than the Apollo samples that had been collected at that time. In fact, high iron content is often an indication of longer-term volcanic processes than had been previously known to have happened on the moon. The volcanic rocks in the regolith were also ancient, with radioisotope ages of around 3.4 billion years. For reference, the first bacterial life is thought to have originated on Earth around that time. This kind of iron-rich basalt shows that volcanic systems on the moon lasted for long periods of time rather than short melting and eruption events as had been previously thought. So there you have it. The Soviets didn't crash their spacecraft into a mountain, and they brought back evidence of ancient lunar volcanism. After the break, we'll be back with our weekly statistics and a random space fact. Stay tuned. To wrap things up, here's a running tally of a few spaceflight statistics for the current year. Toilets currently in space, eight. Four on the ISS, one on the Crew Dragon, one on the Soyuz, one on the Shenzhou, and one on the Tianhe. Total 2021 orbital launch attempts, 86, including seven failures. Total satellites from launches, 1,368. We keep track of orbital launches by where they launched from, also known as spaceport. Here's that breakdown. China, 32. USA, 31. Kazakhstan, 7. Russia, 6. New Zealand, 4. French Guiana, 3. India, 2. 
Iran won. Your random space fact is the Pioneer 1011 full-scale model on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. It's no mere mock-up. It was a fully functional spacecraft that was built along with Pioneer 10 and 11. Despite many proposals to do so, it was never launched and was donated to the museum in 1976. Now, before anyone gets the wild idea of trying again to launch this craft into space, please note that the nuclear generators were replaced with mock-ups before going to the display. This has been The Daily Space.